Hello, I'm Cheryl McCarthy of the City University of New York. Welcome to One to One. Each week, we address issues of timely and timeless concern with newsmakers and the journalists who report on them, with artists, writers, scientists, educators, social scientists, activists, government leaders. We speak with each one to one. There are very few people who understand how government mediates between public and private interest, as well as Peg Breen does. She was host of Inside Albany for several years, and you can't get more inside than that. She served in city government as director of communications for the city council and liaison for cultural affairs for then city council speaker Peter Vallone. And she was the ideal choice for the New York Landmarks Conservancy when searching for a new president. She took office in January of 1994. And today, she'll give us some insights into how that creative and dynamic organization works. Welcome. Thank you. Glad to be here. You know, when I heard about the Landmarks Conservancy, I confused it at first with the Landmarks Preservation Commission, but they're different, aren't they? They're totally different, though we named ourselves to be as make it as confusing as possible. The Landmarks Commission is the city agency, and they decide which buildings are landmarks, and then they regulate. We're a private nonprofit, and we have financial and technical programs that actually help people fix their buildings, and we also advocate for preservation, but we're um, privately funded, private nonprofit. So is the mission, is, is the goal of the Conservancy to help people and organizations that are, that own landmark buildings meet the regulations or renovate them or to meet up the standards of being a landmark? Well, we're there to help them um, maintain their properties. And when you say landmarks or historic buildings, Sometimes you think of grand, on a grand scale. But there are a lot of historic districts in, in New York City that encompass basic brownstones um, or small wooden houses on City Island or in Staten Island. So we're there to help them fix whatever the mostly exterior issues are. And because um, it can be difficult to figure out what's going on in your building or who to hire to fix it, um, our excellent technical staff will go out and help figure out what's going on with your building and help you find the right contractors and architects as well. So we're kind of full service, but mm -hmm. we're there to help the people maintain their properties. Tell us how the Conservancy got started. The Conservancy was started by a group of people who basically felt that there had to be a group that focused solely on preservation. Um, they came out of the Municipal Arts Society, which has a broad mission. You know, they're looking at city planning, they're looking about how you get to the airport. And they wanted, they wanted a group that just focused on property, and they wanted it to be practical. They wanted a technical aspect, and they wanted us to be able to fix buildings, to own property if need be, to hold eas easements, which um, protect buildings uh, in perpetuity. So they really wanted kind of a nuts and bolts, we'll help you fix it group, and that's us. And the, and the first bill, and it was started in 73, mm -hmm. and the first project was, there was a federal archives building down in lower Manhattan. Was that the first project? No, the very first project was what is now the Indian Museum in lower Manhattan down okay. by the Staten Island Ferry. It's a mag it was a magnificent customs house built by Cass Gilbert, um, the architect who also did the Woolworth Building and several other great skyscrapers in New York. And uh, it was surplus government property. And the Conservancy, a very fledgling young group then, um, they held art exhibits in it. They brought businesses to Lower Manhattan to see if they wanted to go in there. And then finally, working with Senator Moynihan, who was on our board and irreplaceable, and one of our board members, who was also on the board of the then Indian Museum up in Washington Heights, they made a deal to move part of the collection to Washington that became part of the Smithsonian. And then the other part remained in the Custom House as a Smithsonian outbranch. So it's an Indian museum. And then once that got underway, federal offices went back on the top floors. So that was a, a, an all-consuming project for a very young organization, but a, a successful one. Okay. Now, there are more than 21,000 buildings protected by the city's landmark law. Mm -hmm. What constitutes a landmark? I mean, in general, what, what makes you a landmark building or a historic block? Usually it's the quality of your architecture. It could be um, a cultural association. 
Um, but usually it's, a, it's an architectural cohesiveness. You are, a, the building is a great representative of a particular style of architecture. Or if you have a district, there are blocks and streets that um, have maintained their architectural uh, character and more or less are of a piece. Um, but mostly it's architectural quality. Now, landmark status is something that is either seen as a blessing mm -hmm. by people who are trying to, you know, preserve an old mm -hmm. building or district, or as a curse, you know, by those who, because there are restrictions that come with landmark mm -hmm. status. Uh, I guess strict restrictions on, as, as we said, on what you can do with the exterior mm -hmm. of the building, mm -hmm. you know, um, what you can do with it in terms of you know, if you want to make money, if you're looking for a different use of the building, so there, those are restrictions. So um, is that sort of where you come in to the picture? Well, Landmarks gets a bad rap. Um, the city's independent budget office a few years ago did a study um, on their own that looked at historic districts and found that historic districts have higher property values because you're maintaining the character of the area. And yes, there are times when the commission says, no, you can't change your windows, or yes, you have to um, fix your um, stoop in a certain way. But ultimately, what they're asking you to do is going to benefit the building in the long term. But yes, the commission often sends people to us, um, either for financial assistance or technical assistance. And um, we're kind of the, the ghostbusters of preservation. Who are you going to call? Mm -hmm. You're going to call the conservancy, and we're going to try to figure out some way to help you. Right. Do landmark buildings ever get demolished? Um, rarely. Rarely. Um, there was an instance earlier this year when the, the Landmarks Commission um, designated a bu particular building on the Bowery. And there's been a lot of interest in the history of the Bowery and kind of protecting a lot of the buildings there. And the city council which has the ultimate say, and they must affirm what the Landmarks Commission has done, um, disagreed and um, did not designate it, or did not affirm the designation, and so that building will be lost. Mm -hmm. But um, once you are a landmark, sometimes, sometimes owners really neglect their buildings, and we call it demolition by neglect. And um, the city will now intervene and sue the owner if, it, if the building gets to um, such a bad state in an attempt to either make the owner make the repairs or get the owner to sell it, and hopefully someone will come in and fix it. Right. So actually destroying a landmark is, is rare, and we want to keep it that way. The, your historic properties fund mm -hmm. um, is the largest, is billed as the largest revolving loan fund for historic preservation in the country. Mm -hmm. How much money in grants and loans have you provided over the years, and do you provide, say, in the course of a single year? Um, in total, um, we've loaned and granted probably close to $38 million, and um, to literally about 1,500 buildings. <clears throat> and if you count um, our one statewide program, we can talk about there are about 1,500 buildings across the state. The loan program itself has now given out 229 loans um, within the five boroughs, mostly in low and moderate income neighborhoods. And um, in turn, our, our loans can generate a whole project, but our loans and grants, um, by the time you total up um, the entire project, particularly with our grants, you're talking about billions of dollars in total construction that we've helped generate. Give me some examples of some properties that were recently helped by the fund. Well, um, we sometimes say brownstones are us. So we were in Harlem, we were in parts of Brooklyn long before they became chic and trendy. So a lot of our work is in, say, brownstone Brooklyn, um, where we do a lot of brownstone repair, we do a lot of repairs that keep the water out, mm -hmm. for instance. Um, so that's a lot. Um, we've Recently we've been into Jackson Heights, Queens, which um, our early co-op buildings built around Central Gardens. And they were all pretty much built at the same time, and they're all running into roof problems um, and cornice problems. Right. And so we've been doing a lot of work there. So um, a lot of our work is outer borough. Probably most of our loans have been, been in um, areas of Brooklyn and in, and in Harlem. Uh, and um, 
again, mostly single family homes, but more and more we're doing, we're seeing co-ops come to us as well. And you have, pro you have projects around the state. How did that happen? We have a statewide program called Sacred Sites. And years ago in Albany, the legislature was considering exempting religious institutions from landmark laws. And the preservation groups at the time were, of course, upset about that, but realized that, um, particularly uh, with religious institutions, there should be some benefit that accrues if you are, if you're going to be landmarked. And um, the Kaplan Foundation came to the Conservancy um, to do a statewide study about the needs of religious institutions across the state. And um, quite, un quite re unremarkably, we discovered that there were a lot of needs. And so they, initial they gave us the initial funding for sacred sites, which now gives out close to $400,000 a year to all kinds of religious buildings all over the state. And um, our grants, we're now over $7 million in grants to 11, 1,100 grants, $7 million, sometimes multiple grants to one institution. And that has generated over half a billion dollars in restoration projects at these and this is often for things like roof repairs or sometimes replacing stained glass windows or I yes, guess point it's, work. Yes, again, it's, it's mostly exterior. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, families want their name on stained glass. Nobody wants it on the gutter. And yet it's... The really important. <laughs> <laughs> right. And these are some of the most important and beautiful buildings in a community, but they're also very complex. So once again, very few people... Um, come out of seminary or come out of uh, any kind of education, really no understanding how to care for them. Right. So we, we publish books, we do workshops around the state. My staff travels around the state to make sure that, um, to analyze the, the institutions themselves and make sure they're finding the, the proper workers that will fix them. And it seems to me that there are a lot of um, religious buildings, I mean, that I see around the city, you know, once had really large, thriving congregations. Mm -hmm. At some point, a lot of the members moved away, right. and now they have very small but committed congregations mm -hmm. who are trying to hold it together. Exactly. And trying to get the money and the resources to, to you know, keep the building open, do the repair work, keep the, the church or the, or the synagogue or whatever operating. That's very true. But I don't think you have to be religious at all to understand how important these buildings are. Um, they embody some of our best art and architecture. They show you immigration patterns. And a lot of them have community programs that benefit um, the larger community. You know, the, the food pantries. On the, the west side, right. The nurseries, the Alcoholics Anonymous meetings, uh, et cetera. So they, they function beyond just the congregations. Right. And yes, but um, a lot of small congregations really can keep it going. And what we try to do is help people phase the work so that it's not overwhelming. It's not the entire building at once, but here's the issue that you need to address right now and it's discreet and then we can, you know, continue on with other projects. And unfortunately, we're never going to save them all, but I think that they're really vital to the larger community and uh, we do our best to keep as many of them going as possible. We're going to take a short break. Then we'll be back with more with Peg Breen, president of the New York Landmarks Conservancy. John can hold his daughter. Marilyn can laugh with her sons. Raphael can play with his sister. Gregory can fly. None of this would have been possible without an organ donor. Keep life going. Sign up to be an organ donor today. You can register when you renew your driver's license or online at SaveLivesNewYork.org. The more New Yorkers who sign up, the more lives saved. One of them could be someone you love. Welcome back to One to One. I'm Cheryl McCarthy of the City University of New York, and I'm talking with Peg Breen, president of the New York Landmarks Conservancy. Tell me about the City Ventures Fund. The City Ventures Fund is a grant program that helps nonprofit community developers. Um, and they may not have the budget to totally um, complete the building they're working on or totally fix all the architectural features of their building. And this doesn't have to, these don't have to be landmarks. We just have to understand that or look at them and think that they have architectural integrity. 
Um, for instance, um, a lot of these grants have helped, we've helped battered women's shelters, we've helped uh, assisted living facilities for aid patients, we've done uh, a lot of buildings that are now limited equity co-ops. So probably over 200 units of, limit, of lower income housing, as well as facilities for things like the battered women and, and the AIDS patients. And in the East Village, for instance, there was a beautiful building by Calvert Vox, who worked with Olmsted on Central Park. And it has stepped Dutch gables and uh, around the door and, and the roof line. And the people doing it over into an assisted living facility for AIDS patients just didn't have the money to, to restore the gables. And that's what our grant did, because we, we feel that all these buildings, having a complete and intact building um, adds to the dignity of the work that the social service group is trying to do for their clients. But the requirement is that it, it have some kind of special architectural interest, is that? Yes. Okay, mm -hmm. okay. Where does the funding for the Conservancy come from? It comes from foundations, uh, corporations, and individuals. Uh, it's, it's a mix. Okay. Do you get any, no government money at all? We get a small grant, um, or we have been getting a small grant, uh, most recently from Senator Kruger for some of our publications. Um, and we used to get a small grant through the Council on the Arts because they have an architecture program, but um, tiny compared to our overall budget. What kind of staff do you have? I have a staff of 14 people. I have an architect. I have people with advanced degrees in building conservation and experience in, in real estate matters. So again, the idea is that my staff can go out and understand what's going on with a building. And then when we give our loans and grants, we often work as uh, almost an owner's rep. And we'll work with the people who are the architects and the engineers and the people doing the work and, and deal with them, all, in a sense, for the homeowner or for the property owner um, so that the homeowner understands what's happening on the building and we're kind of an extra insurance that the building, that the work is being done right and up to landmark standards. Uh, I would imagine that people are constantly clamoring for help, <laughs> for financial help from you. Um, so how, so what's, what's the criteria for giving a loan or a grant? Well, it, it varies from program to program. Um, we act like a boutique bank and if you want a loan from us, um, we look at your financial history, we look at, um, you know, have you paid your taxes? What are your taxes like? Are you, um, what, what are your household expenses now? What type of loan can you afford even at a 3% rate? And often, if there's a lot to be done on a building, we'll again do two steps. Uh, there was a, a woman in Fort Greene who had what turned out to be an 1850s wooden building, but the facade had been stripped off and the porch had been stripped off and a uh, single mother, but in one loan we got the basic facade of the house restored. And then a couple years later in a second loan, we put on the wooden porch that would have echoed the porch that had been there originally. So again, we're very, um, very hands-on and work with them from beginning to end to make sure the project is done appropriately. I would imagine you get a lot more applications for grants and loans than you're able to, to give, or no? Or well, um, we've been fair, the biggest issue is the sacred sites program because the need there is enormous and um, we always need more assistance there. We could always give out a ton more money than, than we have. Um, the, the City Ventures grants and our emergency grants for nonprofits, we pretty much uh, usually have the resources to take care of what comes in, what comes in in a year. And we loan over a million dollars a year. Um, from the, the Basic Historic Properties Fund. And um, quite honestly, if we get a lot more large co-ops coming to us, we're going to have to figure out how to replenish it. But most of our loans have been to single-family homes, mm -hmm. and we've been able to handle it. Has the process of land, have landmarking buildings slowed down at all as a result of the economic conditions? Has that, has that been affected? No, uh, and actually um, this commission under um, the chairman, Robert Tierney, has probably landmarked more than any other commission. And when he came in, he 
um, said specifically that he wanted to look at other boroughs because they felt that all the attention was going to Manhattan. And so he's done a lot more of landmarking in Brooklyn and in Queens and really made a point to spread it around the city. There were, there still are maybe over 20 probably neighborhoods lined up asking to become historic districts because they see the advantages um, in that. So there's always a lot more work to do. And every once in a while, somebody says, oh, there are too many landmarks and you know, you're, you're landmarking too much of the city. It's probably 3% of the city. So there is plenty of room for new growth and new development, but it's the mix of architecture in New York that really makes it special. And it's the layers of our history that really make it unique. And so you always want to keep um, the best of the old while making room for, for new growth. And for instance, as, as Mayor Bloomberg looks ahead for 30 years and what it will take to increase um, housing for the population, it's the buildings that exist now that have served generations before that are perfectly capable of serving future generations. So in effect, you really want to make sure that you are um, restoring and maintaining a lot of the existing buildings that are here because they're fine homes now and they'll be fine homes into the future. There's been a lot of in the news in recent years about Governor's Island, you know, the mm -hmm. former military base uh, that was turned over to the city a few years ago. Um, has the city finally decided what it's going to do with Governor's Island, or is that still up this, in the air? It's up in the air. The city has concentrated on creating um, a, a giant multi-million dollar park out there. And in fact, there's going to be a groundbreaking um, this week um, with the mayor. And the park is nice, but there are fabulous buildings that obviously were once First Army and then Coast Guard. And when you're out there, it looks like a college campus and it would really lend itself to an educational institution. And ultimately, the success of the island is going to be the reuse of those buildings. And um, it's not that they haven't looked, but I think you have to consistently be out there promoting those buildings in the same way you're promoting building a wonderful new park. Have any of those been, buildings been landmarked? Oh, they're all landmarked. Uh, they're all landmarked, I didn't know that. Um, there's a huge historic district there. Oh yes, there are two forts that are part of a part of the National Park Service, okay. and they're a national monument. And then the rest of the older buildings are all landmark. It's oh, a city historic district. Okay, okay. Um, but there really has to be a focus on filling them. Right. And and there needs to be a continued focus on filling them. I, I mentioned some of the previous jobs that you've held with the city. Some of them in a sort of um, public relations uh, capacity. Did you have any prior preparation for working in the in the sort of architecture and design area before you came to this job? No. <laughs> I grew up in a house in upstate New York that my great-grandfather built after the Civil War. And I had an instinctive love of old buildings. And when I was doing Inside Albany, I was on a couple of local boards that were preservation-minded, but again, did it more from a behind-the-scenes, here's how you get publicity, here's how you deal with... Uh, you know, politicians thing. Um, no particular um, background at all. So they, they took a leap of faith, <laughs> in a sense, by hiring me. But as you know, um, politics and reporting are handy backgrounds. That's true. What, is, what specific projects of the Conservancy have excited you the most, if you had to pluck out a few from your portfolio? Um, probably, you have to be in preservation for the long haul. And we have been on the south side of Ellis Island since the mid-90s. And that is a giant, was the largest hospital complex of its day. And even though the museum was restored years ago, the rest of the island hasn't been. And we led a campaign to get Congress to put money in to stabilize the buildings. We actually stabilized one of the buildings ourselves to show the National Park Service that it could be done and for a reasonable amount. And all these years later, there's still, um, we have a seat now on the board of a national group that was formed to ultimately put uses into the building. But between bureaucracy, between the ups and downs of the economy, it hasn't happened yet. So to me, Ellis Island is the closest thing that America has to a national shrine. One in 10 Americans have an ancestor that came through Ellis Island. When foreigners come, they go to Ellis Island because so many people from their country went through Ellis Island. So. It tugs at my heart no matter how many times I am out there. And to me, that is a great unfinished project that we have a role to play, but that the federal government needs to step up as well. Right. 
Well, it's fascinating. Uh, learn, I have found it fascinating learning about the, uh, the work of the Conservancy, and uh, I hope that our viewers did so as well. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> We're out of time, I'm afraid, but I want to thank Peg Breen, president of the New York Landmarks Conservancy, for joining us today. If you'd like more information about the Conservancy or any of its programs and services, go to nylandmarks.org. For the City University of New York and One to One, I'm Cheryl McCarthy.